The minister takes his text from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. The sermon we're going to hear today is from the Reverend Hugh Binning, and it was originally published in 1858. And the minister begins with the seventh verse. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went he out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went he out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets, and calling unto their fellows, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil." The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. The main text that the Reverend Binning draws our attention to is verse 16, the first half, where, he, where it reads, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? When our Lord Jesus, who had the tongue of the learned, and spoke as never man spake, did now and then find a difficulty to express the matter herein contained, what shall we do? The matter indeed is of great importance, a soul matter, and therefore of great moment, a mystery, and therefore not easily expressed. No doubt he knows how to paint out this to the life, that we might rather behold it with our eyes than hear it with our ears. Yet he uses this manner of expression, to stamp our hearts with a deep apprehension of the weight of the matter and the depth of it. It concerns us all, as much as we can, to consider and attend unto it. Two things are contained here. The reception Christ gets in the world, of the most part, and the reception he gets from a few children, of whom he is justified. I say it concerns you greatly to observe this, for Christ observed it very narrowly. What success both his forerunner and himself had. Christ begins here to expostulate with the multitudes and with the scribes and Pharisees about it. But ere all be done, he will complain to the Father. He now complains unto you that he gets not ready acceptance amongst you if it be possible that you may repent of the great injury done to the Son of God. No, not so much to Christ as your own souls. For as we are instructed in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 36, All who hate me love death, and he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. Woe unto your souls, for you have not hurt Christ by so much despising him. You have not prejudiced the gospel, but ye have rewarded evil to yourselves, as we consider in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 9. I say, Christ now complains of you to yourselves. If so be, you will bethink yourselves in earnest and return to yourselves. But if you will not, he will at length complain to the Father. When he renders up the kingdom and gives an account of his administration unto God, he will report what reception you gave his word. For he will say, I have labored in vain and spent my strength for naught with such a man. 
all threatenings, all entreaties, would not prevail with him to forsake his drunkenness, his swearing, his covetousness, his oppressions. You know Christ's last long prayer in John chapter 17. He gives an account in it what acceptance he had among men when he is finishing his ministry. These are the men he now speaks unto in the text where we read, Whereunto shall I liken this generation? Thus he speaks of them to his father, O righteous father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. Well then, this is not so light a matter as you apprehend. You come to hear daily, but know you not that you shall give an account of your hearing? Know you not that there is one who observes and marks all the impressions which the word makes on your consciences? He knows all the blows of the sword of the word that returns making no impression on your consciences. Christ says to the multitudes here, and what went ye out for to see? I pray you, what went ye out to see, seeing ye have not believed his report? Why went ye out into the wilderness? Know ye who spake, or in whose authority? May we not speak in these terms unto you, when we consider the little fruit of the gospel? What do you come to see? And what do you come to hear every Sabbath and other solemn days? I pray you ask at your own hearts what your purpose is. Wherefore do you come together so often? Men are rational in their business. They do nothing but for some purpose. They labor and plow and sow in order to reap. They buy and sell to get gain. They have many projects and designs they still seek to accomplish. And shall we be only in matters of salvation and damnation so irrational? Shall we in the greatest thing of the greatest moment, because of eternal concernment, be as perishing brutish beasts that know not what we aim at? Christ will in the end ask you, what went ye out of your own houses so often to hear? What went you out to see? I pray you, what will you answer? If you say, we went to hear the word of the Lord, then he shall answer you, and why did not you obey it? Then why did you not hear it as my word and regard it more? If you shall say, we went to hear a man speak some good words unto us for an hour or two. Then is Christ also engaged against you because he sent him and you despise him. For he says, he that despises me despises him that sent me. So you, so you shall be cast both the ways. If you think this to be God's word, I wonder why you do not receive it with the stamp of his authority in your hearts. Why do you not bow your hearts to it? For it shall endure forever and judge you. Why do you not accept so many fair offers, so many sad warnings? Are not the drunkards warned every day by this word that the curse of the Lord shall come upon them? Is not every one of you, according to your several stations and circumstances, warned to forsake your wicked ways and your evil thoughts, to flee from the wrath to come, before the decree of the Lord pass forth and before his fury burn as an oven? And if you think these to be the true words of the eternal God, and the sayings of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, and the truth itself, if you believe it as you profess to do, why do you not get out of the way of that wrath which continues upon these sinners daily? Shall you escape the judgment of God? Shall not his word overtake you, though ministers that speak unto you will not live forever? But these words they speak will surely take hold of you, as they did your fathers, so that you shall say, as we read in Zechariah 1, verse 6, Like as the Lord of hosts hath said, He will do unto us, so hath he done. If you do not think this is God's word, I beseech you, why do you come here so often? What do you come to hear? Why take you so much needless pains? Your coming here seems to speak that you think it to be God's word. And yet, your conversation declares more plainly that you do not believe it. Yet, Christ 
takes notice of you. And oh, that you, beloved, would search yourselves so that you might hear the word as in the sight of the all-seeing God and in his sight, who will judge you according to it. A sermon thus heard would be more profitable than all that ever you heard. Now, to what purpose speak we of these things unto you, and why do we choose this discourse when you expect to hear public things? I will tell you the reason of it. Because I conceive this is the great sin of the times, and the most reprehensive and fountain sin, the root of all our profanity and malignity, even this which Christ points out in this similitude. The great blessing and privilege of this nation is the gospel. You all must grant this. Now then, the great misery and sin of this nation is the abuse and contempt of the glorious gospel. And if once we could make you sensible of this, you would mourn for all other particular sins. The words are very comprehensive. You shall find, them, find in them the different manifestations of God in his word reduced to two heads. The Lord either mourns to us to make us mourn or joys to us to make us dance. A similitude and likeness is the end of all the manifestations of himself that we be one with him. Therefore, when he would move our affections in us, he puts on the like and clothes himself in his word and dispensation with such a habit as is suitable. So you have both law and gospel. He laments in the one. He pipes in the other. Both sad and glad dispensations of his providence may be subordinate to these. The one, I mean his judgments, representing that to our eyes which his law did to our ears, making the visible of his justice, which we heard. The other, I mean mercies, represents that to our eyes which the gospel did to our ears, making his good will, his forbearance, and long-suffering and compassion visible, that men might say, as we have heard, so have we seen in the city of our God. Now these should stir up suitable affections in men. This is their intendment and purpose, to stir up joy and grief, sorrow for sin on the one hand, and joy in the Lord's salvation on the other hand, hatred of sin by the one, and the love of Christ by the other. But what is the reception these get in the world? You shall see it different. In some, it meets with different affections, or it makes them and moves them, and these do justify wisdom. The accomplishment and performance of God's purposes in the salvation of souls justifies his word. They justify Christ by believing in him. Christ justifies us by making us to believe in him and applying his own righteousness to us. He that believes justifies the word and Christ in the word because he sets to his seal that God is true. And Christ likewise justifies the believer by applying his righteousness unto him. The believer justifies wisdom by acknowledging it as the Father's wisdom. Christ justifies the believer by making him and pronouncing him righteous and a son of God. But in others, and in these a great many, <clears throat> it generally meets with hard hearts, stupid and insensible, incapable of these impressions. You know music is very apt to work upon men's spirits and does stir up several passions in them as joy or grief. Now Christ and his ministers are the musicians that do apply their songs to catch men's ears and hearts. If so be, they may stop their course 
and not perish. These are blessed sirens that do so, and pipe day and night in in season and out of season, some sad and woeful songs of men's sin and God's wrath, of the day of judgment, of eternal punishment, that if it be possible, men may foreapprehend these ills before they fall into them without recovery. These are the boys in the marketplaces that strive to sadden your hearts and make you lament in time before the day of howling and weeping and gnashing of teeth. These also have as many joyful and glad songs, sweetening the sad. It may be diverse men have diverse parts of this harmony. John had the woeful and sad part. Christ took the joyful and glad part. So the one answered the other, and both made a complete harmony. It may be one man in one song mixes these two and makes good music alone. The one part is intended to move men to grief and mourn, that they may not mourn forever. The other, to comfort in the meantime, these that mourn, to mix their mourning with their hope of that blessed delivery in Jesus Christ. Now, what is the reception these get from the most part? They can neither move men to one affection nor another. They will neither mourn nor dance. As the children complain of some rude and rustic spirits that are incapable of music and cannot discern one song from another, so does Christ complain of a generation of men They can neither repent nor believe. They care for none of these things. His threatenings and denunciations of wrath are a small thing to them, and his consolations appear also to be inconsiderable. Their souls are otherwise taken up, that they have no sense to discern the transcendent excellency of eternal things. We would then press upon your consciences these three things. First, that the word of God, comprehending the law and gospel, contains both the saddest tunes and the most joyful and sweet songs in the world. Next, we would discover unto you the great sin and extreme stupidity of this generation, of which you are a part that you may know the controversy God has with the land. And then at length, we would labor to persuade you to the right use of this gospel and justifying of wisdom if you would be his children. The law is indeed a sad song and lamentation. It surpasses all the complaints and lamentations among men. You know the voice in which it was given at Sinai. It was delivered with great thunders. Great terrors accompanied it. The law is a voice of words and thunder, which made these that heard it entreat that it should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure the word that was commanded, as we read in Hebrews 12, verses 18 and 19. You would think if they were holy men, they would not be afraid of it. But so terrible was that sight... And that voice, that it even made holy Moses himself exceedingly fear and quake. It made a great host, more numerous than all the inhabitants of Scotland, to tremble exceedingly. And why was it so sad and terrible? Even because it was a law that publishes transgression. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. If there were no fear of judgment and wrath, yet I am sure there is none that can reasonably consider that excellent estate in which he was once, that throne of eminency, above the creatures, that height of dignity and conformity and likeness to God, that incomparable happiness of communion with the supreme fountain of life. None, I say, none can duly ponder these things 
but they will think sin to be the greatest misery of mankind. They must be affected with the sense of that inestimable treasure they lost. And how sad a consideration is it to view that cloud of beastly lusts of flesh and earth that was interposed between the Son of Righteousness and our souls, which has made this perpetual eclipse, this eternal night and darkness. How sad is it to look upon our ruin and compare it with that stately edifice of innocent Adam. How are we fallen from the height of our excellency and made lower than the beasts when we were once but a little lower than the angels? But then, if you shall consider all that followed upon this, the innumerable abominations of men, so contrary to that holy law and God's holiness that has flowed from this corrupt fountain, and has defiled so many generations of men that they are all bruises and putrefied sores and in nothing sound from the head to the foot. The soil within becomes the sink of all pollution. The members without the conduits it runs through and weapons of unrighteousness against our maker. And what a consideration is this alone How vile and ugly does that holy and spiritual law make the most refined and polished civilian? He that has poor natural gifts, most extracted from the dregs of the multitude, oh, how abominable will he appear in this glass, in this perfect law of liberty, so that men would despise themselves and repent in dust and ashes if once they did see their own likeness. You would run from yourselves as children that have taken up with their own beauty, but are spoiled with the smallpox. Let such ones look into a glass, and it will almost make them mad. But if we shall stay and hear out the trumpet which sounds louder and louder, there will be yet more reason of trembling. For it becomes a voice publishing judgment and wrath, for therein is the wrath of God. As we read in Romans 1, verse 18, revealed from heaven, the wrath of God revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It speaks much of all men's sins, that every mouth may be stopped. But the voice waxed louder and louder. The song grows still sadder that all the world may become guilty before God, as referenced in Romans 3, verse 19. Galatians 3, verse 10 tells us, it publishes first the command and then follows the sad and weighty curse of God. Cursed is everyone that abides not in all things which are written in the law. As many curses as breaches of the law. And what a dreadful song is this. You shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. If he had said, you shall be eternally banished from God, what an incomparable loss had this been. Men would lead an unpleasant life who had fallen from the expectation of an earthly kingdom. But what shall it be to fall from the expectation of of a heavenly kingdom. But when withal there is an eternal pain with that eternal loss and an incomparable pain with incomparable loss, everlasting destruction from God's presence joined with this, always to be destroyed and never to be made an end of It is the comfort of bodily torments and even of death itself that it shall be quickly gone. And the destruction ends in the destruction of the body and so there is no more pain. But here is an eternal destruction. Not a dying and then a death, but an eternal dying without tasting death. Now consider, if you can indeed think, 
what it is to have a law of enmity and a handwriting of ordinances against us. As many curses written up in God's register against us as there were transgressions of the law multiplied and God himself engaged to be against us. As, as many curses and God himself engaged to be against us to have no mercy on us and not to spare us. Brethren, could any heart endure or any hands be strong if they would apprehend this? Would the denunciation of war, the publishing of affliction, the sentence of earthly judges, would they once be remembered beside this? If you would imagine all the torments and rackings that have been found out by the most cruel tyrants against men, all to be centered in one, and all the grief and pain of these who have died terrible deaths to be joined in one. What would it be to this? It would be but as a drop of that wrath and vexation that wicked souls find in hell and are drowned into and that everlastingly without end. But we must not dwell always at Mount Sinai. We are called to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to hear a sweet and calm voice of peace, to hear the sweet and pleasant songs of the sweet psalmist of Israel and of our glorious peacemaker, Christ Jesus, the desire of all the nations and the blessing of all the families of the earth. Brethren, his song is a joyful sound, and blessed are they that hear it. I am come, says Christ, to seek and to save that which was lost. I am come to save sinners and the chief of sinners. Let all those who find their spirits saddened by the terrible law, or who find themselves accursed from the Lord, and cannot be justified by the law of Moses, come unto me. Cast your souls upon me, and ye shall find ease to them. Are you pressed under the heavy burden of sin and wrath? Come unto me, and I will give you ease. Put it over upon me. Do you think yourselves not wearied, nor burdened enough, and yet you would be quit of sin and misery? Do your souls desire to embrace this salvation? Come unto me, and I will not cast you out. Whoever comes on whatsoever terms, in whatsoever condition, I will in no case cast you out. Do not suppose cases to exclude yourselves. I know no case. You who cannot be justified by the law of Moses, come unto me and you shall be justified from all things from which you, ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. You who have no righteousness of your own and see the righteousness of God revealed with wrath against you, now come to me. I have a righteousness of God beside the law and will reveal it to you. You have a band of enmity and handwriting of ordinances against you. But come unto me, for I have canceled it in the cross and slain the enmity, so it shall never do you any harm. In a word, this is the messenger, the messenger whose feet are beautiful that publishes glad tidings of peace. This is the mediator who reconciles us unto God. The whole gospel and covenant of grace is a bundle of precious promises. It is a set of pleasant, melodious songs that may accompany us through our wearisome pilgrimage and refresh us till we come unto the city where we shall all sing the song of the Lamb. What a song is liberty to captives and prisoners, light to them that sit in darkness, opening of the eyes to the blind, gladness of spirit to those who are heavy of in spirit. You would all think salvation and remission of sins a sweet song. But if you would discern it, you would find nothing sweeter in the gospel 
then this redemption from all iniquity, from sin itself, and from all kind of misery. How lovely and pleasant a thing is that. When Christ has piped unto you the remission of all sins in his own blood, then he plays the most sweet song, the renunciation of sin, and dying to this world by his death and resurrection. Many listen to the song of justification, but they will not abide to hear out all the song. He is our sanctification and redemption, as well as our righteousness. Always to whomsoever he is pleasant, when he puts his yoke upon them, he will be more pleasant in bearing it. Whosoever gladly hears Jesus singing of righteousness and holiness, they shall also hear him sing of glory and happiness. Those who dance at the springs of righteousness and sanctification, what an eternal triumph and exultation waits on them when he is singing the songs, the song of complete redemption. Are these things so? Is this the law and this the gospel? Do they daily sound in our ears? And what reception, I pray you, do they get from this generation? Indeed, Christ's complaint has place here. Whereunto shall our generation be likened? For he has lamented to us, and we have not mourned. He has piped to us, and we have not danced. We will neither be made glad nor sad by these things. How long has the word of the Lord been preached unto you, and whose heart trembled at it? Shall the lion roar, and the beasts of the field not be afraid? The lion has roared often to us. God has spoken often. Who will not fear? And yet who does fear? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, in congregations every day, that terrible trumpet of Mount Sinai that proclaims war between God and men, and yet will not the people be afraid? Have not every one of you heard your transgressions told you? Are you not guilty of all the breaches of God's holy law? Has not the curse been pronounced against you for these? And yet who believes the report? You will not do so much as to sit down and examine your own guiltiness till your mouth be stopped and till you put it in the dust before God's justice. And when we speak of hell unto you and of the curses of God passed upon all men, you bless yourselves in your own eyes, saying, Peace, peace, even though you walk in the imagination of your own hearts. Add sin to sin and drunkenness to thirst, as referenced in Deuteronomy 29, verse 20. <clears throat> now, when all this is told you, that many shall be condemned and few saved, and that God is righteous to execute judgment and render vengeance on you, you say within yourselves, for God's sake, is all this true? But where is the mourning at his lamentations when there is no feeling or believing them to be true? Your minds are not convinced of the law of God, and how shall your hearts be moved? Christ Jesus laments unto you as he wept over Jerusalem. How often would I have gathered thee, and thou wouldest not? What means he? Certainly he would have you to sympathize with your own condition. When he that is in himself blessed and needs not us is so affected with our misery, how should we sympathize with our own misery? God seems to be affected with it, though there be no shadow of turning in him. Yet he clothes his words with such affections. Why will ye die? Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me. He sounds the proclamation before the stroke. If it be possible to move you to some sense of your condition that concerns you most nearly. Yet who judges himself that he may not be judged? 
the ministers of the Lord or Christians may put to their ear and hearken to men in their retiring places. But who repents in dust and ashes and says, what have I done? As we read of in Jeremiah 8 verse 6. But every man goes on in his course without stop. The word you hear on the Sabbath day against your drunkenness, your oppressions, your covetousness, your formality, it does not lay any bands on you to keep you from these things. Long may we hearken to you in secret, ere we hear many of you mourn for these things or turn from them. Where is he that is afraid of the wrath of God, though it be often denounced against him? Do not men sleep over their time and dream of escaping from it? Every man has a refuge of lies he trusts in and will not forsake his sins. Again, on the other hand, whose heart rejoices within them to hear the joyful sound? Because men do not receive the law and mourn when he laments, they cannot receive the gospel. It cannot be glad news to any but the soul that receives sad tidings, the sentence of death in its bosom. Therefore, Christ Jesus is daily offered and as often despised as a thing of naught and of no value. You hear every day of deliverance from eternal wrath and a kingdom purchased unto you and you are no more affected than if we came and told you stories of some Spanish conquest that belonged not unto you. Would not the ears and hearts of some men be more tickled with idle and unprofitable tales that are for no purpose but driving away the present time than that than they are with this everlasting salvation? Some men have more pleasure to read an idle book than to search the Holy Scriptures though in them this inestimable jewel of eternal life be hid. The vain things of this present world have a voice unto you of pleasure and profit and credit. They will pipe unto you, and ye will listen unto their sound, but ye know not that the dead are there, and that it is the way to the chambers of hell. Brethren, these indeed are the mythical sirens that entice passengers by the way with their sweet songs, and having allured them to follow, lead them to perishing. Here is the voice that has come down from heaven, the word that was with God, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. He has gone before you and undertakes to guide you. He comes and calls upon simple men, The Father's wisdom calls the simple ones to understand wisdom, to find life and peace. Will you then so far wrong your own souls as to refuse it? And yet the most part are so busied with this world and their own lusts that the sweetest and pleasantest offers in the gospel sound not so sweet unto them as the clink of their money or the sound of oil and wine in a cup. Any musician would affect them more than the sweet singer of Israel, the anointed of the God of Jacob. However, these souls that have mourned and danced according to Christ's motions, and whose hearts have exulted within them at the message of wisdom and word of reconciliation, blessed are you, You are of another generation, children of wisdom, you who desire to hear his voice. Let me hear thy voice, O thou that dwellest in the gardens. The companions hear thy voice, for thy voice is sweet and thy countenance is comely. If this be the voice of your heart, you are blessed. You may indeed dance, you who have rejoiced in his salvation, or you who have mourned at his lamentation. Thy dancing is but yet coming, for his piping is but yet coming. When all the companies of wisdom's children shall be gathered together in that general assembly of the firstborn, Christ Jesus, 
the head of all principalities, and in special the head of the body, the church, shall lead the ring. And there shall be eternal praises and songs of those that follow the Lamb. They shall echo into him who shall begin that song of the hallelujah, salvation, blessing, honor, glory, and power to the Lamb. Now, whereunto shall this generation be likened that are not affected with these things? What strange stupidity and senselessness is it that men are not affected with things of so great and so near concernment? It would require the art of men to express the obstinacy of some Christian professors, or rather, a pen steeped in hell. He would be thought unnatural that would not grieve at his friend's death or loss. And what shall they be called that will not sympathize with themselves? That is, their souls. <clears throat> if we speak to you of corporal calamities and you would, could not be moved, that is great stupidity. But what stupidity is it that men will not consider their own souls. What shall you profit if you lose your precious souls and be cast away? It is the greatest loss that is told you and the greatest gain. Your affections are moved with perishing things. Everything puts them up or down and casts the balance with you. What deep ignorance and inconsideration is it that you who can mourn for loss of goods, of children, of health, <clears throat> of friends, that you cannot be moved to sorrow for the sin of your soul, for the eternal loss of your soul. Other sorrows cannot profit you, but this is the only profitable mourning. If you are told your sin and misery... To make you despair and mourn eternally, you had some excuse to delay and forget it as long as you can. But when all this is told you, that you may escape from it, will you not consider it? When you are desired to mourn, that you may be comforted forever, will you not mourn? We would have you to anticipate the day of judgment that you may judge yourselves, and then you shall not be judged. What folly and madness is this to delay it till endless, irremediable morning come, a day that has no light mixed with darkness. Those that now mourn at that law and for their sin and dance at the promises of the gospel may well be called children of wisdom. And oh, how may this generation be said to be begotten of foolishness as their father and wildness as their mother? Or is there any such folly as this to lose a man's self absolutely and irrecoverably for that which they cannot always have? Is there any such folly as to refuse this healing medicine for the little bitterness which is in it, and then to incur eternal death. <clears throat> now what should we do then? What does the Word of God call you to do? This is it. To mourn and rejoice. And this is to justify wisdom. These two are the pulse of a Christian. According as he finds his grief and joy, so is he. All of you have these affections, but they are not right placed. They are not pitched upon suitable objects. The worldling hath no other joy but carnal mirth, no other grief but that which is carnal. These are limited within the bounds of time. Some loss or some gain, some pleasure or pain, some honor or dishonor, these are the poles all his affections turn about on. Now then, we exhort and beseech you, as you would flee from the wrath to come, 
consider it now and fear it. As you would not partake with this untoward generation in their plagues, so be not like them in their stupidity. You are called to consider your sins and God's wrath, that you may turn unto the Lord, and then you will hear the voice of peace crying unto thee, Be of good comfort, thy sins are forgiven thee. If you submit unto the justice of God, or unto the holiness and righteousness of his law in condemning you, you justify wisdom in part. But you who have justified wisdom thus far, do not condemn wisdom after it. Justify the gospel in believing upon Jesus Christ. Receive it as a true and faithful saying with your hearts, and this shall justify you. And if you justify the wisdom of God in prescribing the righteousness of Christ unto you, you will also justify wisdom in prescribing a rule of holiness and obedience unto you, and count all his paths pleasantness and peace. You must dance at the commandments as well as the promises, because all God's precepts are really promises. You have nothing to do but to believe them as the way, and then to dance until you all sing the song of the Lamb with the saints above. Now if you believe his law and gospel and be suitably affected with these, you are led also to sympathize with all the dispensations of his providence. Does God lament to you in his works as well as his word? O oh, then, Christians, we exhort you to mourn. Yet, mourning because of his lamentable providence should be joined with rejoicing in his word. We ought to agree with the inspired writer. God hath spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. We are a stupid generation that can neither see nor hear. Neither can we be affected with what we see nor hear. Do not his judgments go forth as a lamp that burns? Yet who considers? Does not the lion roar? But who is afraid? Is there not a voice publishing affliction? Has not God's rod a loud voice? And yet who hears it? Who fears? We do not receive agreeable impressions of the Lord's dealing with us, but every man puts the day of evil far from him. He will not apprehend public rods till they become personal, and therefore they must become personal. If you were mourning in a penitent manner, as a repenting soul laments, would not our fast days have more soul affliction attending them? If you did dance as God pipes in his providence, would not our solemn feasts have more soul rejoicing and heavenly mirth? Alas, for that deep sleep that has fallen upon so many Christians. How few stir up themselves to take hold upon God, though he hides his face and threatens to depart from us. Brethren, the Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him and fear for him with all your heart, you will find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. That concludes the sermon. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video, or as a printed book or booklet. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at 
swrb at swrb.com by phone at 780-450-3730 by fax at 780-468-1096 or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L 3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle is adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important when he says that God had commanded no such thing and that it never 